evening. It's uh, a little bit past seven and we are ready to start. I'd like to call the meeting to order. Can I have an acceptance of the agenda? So moved. Second. Moved by Mr. Harris, second by Mr. Danny. All in favor? Aye. 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 It is unanimous. Um, we'll start off by starting with our walk-in period. Are there any walk-ins here? We'll start with Mr. Banger. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would like to uh, announce today that on Saturday, the wind turbine will be ha having a blade signing event whereby uh, one of the 134 foot blades will be in town on Friday afternoon. On Saturday, it'll be parked at the Widow's Walk Golf Course and I would encourage all folks with children and grandchildren to come down to Widow's Walk and sign the name on the, the blade. Um, we have the uh, a little informative brochure that we're going to hand out to everyone who's there describing the benefits of the turbine, the height of it, the uh, amount of power that is generated, and would encourage all situate residents to come down on Saturday between 1 and 3 and sign the turbine blade. That's great. Thanks for putting that together. So it's going to be in the Widow's Walk parking lot. Yes. Probably on a huge trailer. And where should people park? At right in Widow's Walk? They'll be able to park in the parking lot, and the police chief is making arrangements for parking along the driftway in the same manner that there's parking during the Easter egg event. So on the golf course side of the driftway, parking will be allowed. No parking will be allowed on the river side of the driftway. There Great. will be parking in the parking lot as well. Great. So this Saturday, between 1 and 3, come down to a widow's walk and you'll get to put your name on one of the 132 foot blades and uh, you'll be able to see it for the next 25 years. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Al. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Are there any other walk-ins? Yes, ma'am. I'm Leslie Bestercy, and I uh, represent a new group called the Friends of the Driftway. And I have a flyer I'd like to hi na um, hand out. What it does is it addresses our concern that the selectmen are giving away two and a half acres of land for nominal value instead of selling it at fair market value for the Massachusetts Mass Massasoit Ocean Center. So we just have a concern about that. So we'd like to give you the flyer, and maybe you can at some point clarify that for us. Wait, can you just give your address? For sure. just for just say your address so that we'll have it on the record. Lastway, L A D D S W A Y. I mean, I understand. I looked at the uh, RFP, and I guess it said that one acre will be given away for nominal amount, and it doesn't address the other acre and a half. So we're not really sure whether the residents will get the benefit of fair market value on that sale. Um. I think you will, but not through the means of um, a purchase and sale agreement for the property. How will we get that? Well, you'll get it through uh, um, possibly a payment in lieu of taxes, so some sort of payment other than a sale of property. You'll get it through increased commerce in the town, and you'll get it um, through um, I think you know, that job creation. You know, you'll get it through, excuse point, me, um, you know, you'll get it through um, people coming to town and spending their money and, and resources through local receipts on those areas. I think our concern there is that when we say that it's something in lieu of taxes, that's um, a choice. It's negotiable. And so if it's several million dollars worth of land, right now the, the town is in a fiscally bad place. And that money could certainly be helpful to the town. The other piece is if the real estate tax is on it, a commercially developed property, then um, schools will get a constant continual revenue stream from the real estate taxes. And my understanding is if it's a nonprofit, um, there would be no real estate taxes that they would have to pay. And unless there's an agreement up front in writing, they really don't have to pay anything unless they decide they would like to. Right. And all that will be negotiated through the process, but that's what payment in lieu of taxes is. It's, it's revenue streams that would come through the town through other avenues other than taxes. But they wouldn't pay it. You're just saying there'll be more business in the town. No, no. There's also some sort of potentially payment in lieu of taxes that would be some sort of fee-based thing, perhaps. 
potentially or would that actually be well, it hasn't been, been negotiated yet so none it's it's very it's in the beginning stages right now so all of that will be worked out in whatever contract if a contract can be devised between the two parties um, as well as like a fair market value it will be sold at or it's not going to be sold it's going to be given away yeah so that's a few million dollars that the town residents will not have a benefit from i don't think a few million dollars but um I don't, I don't know what the current acreage price is, but I know it's not a million dollars an acre, especially one that's butted up against a, a, a landfill. Um, you know, I, I don't think that that's the case in that piece of property, but. It is um, commercially zoned, though. It is. Okay, well, we have a flyer that we'd just like to leave with you sure. so that you can see what it is we're addressing on this. Should I just leave this here? Yeah, you can leave it with Kim and we'll take a look at it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other walk-ins? Okay, seeing none, then we'll move on to item number three, which is a discussion vote <coughs> of uh, the Greater Attleboro Taunton Regional Transit Authority, GATRA. And um, the town administrator and Florence, I think, are here to present. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Pam, come on up. Come on up. Come on up to the chair, too. Okay. <laughs> uh, we've been looking yeah, Zach, can you get there, get them? If, if not, Florence, can you move the mic over? Sure. Sorry. I want right. to make sure everybody can hear you. Yeah, just introduce yourself. All right, I'm Florence Choate. I'm the director of the Council on Aging. I'm Pam Davis, chair of the Council on Aging Board of Directors. Okay. Um, about two years ago, we ran into some real concerns about transportation. And um, uh, we had spent some time <coughs> trying to get, especially for seniors, it was just initially looking at senior transportation and the possibility that we could not meet the needs because they keep growing so, so fast. So I looked into uh, the ride because Situate is the only uh, Hingham and Marshfield and um, Duxbury have the ride, we do not. So I looked into the ride and called everybody to see if that was a possibility that Situate could get the ride, which is an MBTA program, which um, is really for handicapped only. And that was something that Jeff Dugan from the um, Council on Disabilities and myself talked about that. that. Well, after about three months of calling everybody, I got a call saying, Florence, you're not getting the ride. So uh, we started to look at what the next best avenue would be because transportation is an issue. We have to take our vans off the road by 3 o'clock. We can't afford to extend it because it just costs too much money and we have, we have to work within a budget. So oftentimes people are left out. Um, one of the things that how we started to think about the whole town was because one of the issues for seniors was very often they wanted to go to Boston for the day and we could take them up there but if they were coming back at 4 or 4.30 there was no uh, no way for them to get back home so uh, we started to look at other avenues in the town uh, why something like Gatra would work uh, we saw that uh, the, the children who go to uh, BC High, get, and there's a lot of them, get off that train in the afternoons, and they have to get home, and generally it's the parent who picks them up, or they, they, have, uh, they swap rides or share rides, and it, it becomes problematic at times for these families. Um, also, students who work, who go to school in the high school, who may have a job downtown, so there were lots and lots of things we were seeing. We were seeing people without cars who couldn't get to the, the market. And even um, with um, the summer, there are people who go into the, um, the, come in and sail into the harbor. And there are so many things in situate for them to see. And once you come in on a boat, because I used to be a boater, once you come in on a boat, you're pretty much stuck unless there's transportation or you have a bicycle aboard your bo boat. So that was something, the trying to rebuild or get, 
get people to look at the town, the uh, not situate, um, going to the museums and that, that are under service right now that do not get the traffic that sh they should have because they're wonderful things to see. So I started to look into Gatra. Um, a friend of mine runs the, it's a transportation authority and it's, the money is federal. And the idea is for, uh, to uh, build these uh, transportation uh, um, authorities so that people who are in underserved um, communities can have transportation. And it's all across the country. It, it enjoys a wonderful reputation. So um, I had talked to the person who runs the Cape Cod thing, and he put me through to Francis Gay, who is the director of GATRA. Now I looked into GATRA. GATRA has a marvelous reputation. It's considered one of the best. There's probably seven transit authorities in, in uh, the state of Massachusetts, all funded by the federal government. When we first started looking into it, um, I would be talking back and forth to our town manager. So, um, and giving her what information, she'd give me feedback. So, um, we, uh, we started looking at it. It was a matter of money. And I, and I knew what the economics were at the time. So, if it was gonna cost any money, it was a no-go. So, when I talked to Mr. Gay, um, I said that to him and he said, it doesn't cost you any money. Um, I had known that Duxbury, I had gone over and looked at their, uh, their setup, Pam went with me, uh, saw how it functioned and saw how it was going to work. And um, what Mr. Gay told me was that every year, everybody who has um, a contract with the MBTA pays um, a, 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 some sort of I don't know, I call it a tribute, but I guess it's a fee. And we pay, I believe, but I'm not sure, and I'm sure uh, Mrs. Vincenzi could tell me if I'm right or not. I think it's 116,000 a year. And so we pay that and we don't get it, we don't receive anything for it. So when I spoke to Mr. Gay, he said, well, this is why Duxbury, Marshfield, and the other towns went with them because you take the money that's paid every year to the MBTA can be uh, transferred to GATRA and then you can run the bus system and the town doesn't have to put any money into it. Um, every town does it a little differently. In, um, in Duxbury they, they, do, uh, they have a couple of routes and they do all of the senior transportation. If you were to decide that's the way it would go, then um, we, they, we, uh, they would come in and take over the transportation and vendor it out. Uh, they, at that point, once they come in, uh, the vans are provided for by the state, by the federal government, and so there isn't any cost for maintenance, there's no cost for gas, there is absolutely, the, the fee for a ride for a senior is 50 cents. Uh, for an adult, I uh, mean for uh, somebody who, or a child, it's 50 cents. For um, a regular adult, it's a dollar. So it's, it's very, very doable. And um, they would like to, if they come in, put the transportation into the senior center because we already have it set up. Um, this is really, I think, a wonderful, wonderful use of that money. And I think it would benefit, we're, we're trying to develop economic development <coughs> in, this, in, in this town. I think things like that will go a long way to help with that. So, and you know, selfishly, I would like to see um, both seniors and the rest of the town. This is not just for seniors, this is for the town. And anything that benefits the town benefits all of us. Great. <clears throat> um, so basically, the f the money that we're paying through the cherry sheet ends up going to this organization. Yes, it does. And who gets the dollar and the fifty cents for every ride? You just pay it like a taxi. Yeah, yes. You when you get on, just like if you were getting on a bus, yeah. uh, you give it to the driver. Okay. You give it to the driver, and he collects whoever the driver is. And the town would determine the routes and what. The town would determine the routes. They would sit down and determine how they want to carry that out. 
and that's strictly up to the town to do that. Mr. Down with Gatra. Right. Gatra, Gatra. Mr. Mr. Gay is, you know, is is prepared to go ahead with this, right. and he's just waiting for us to decide whether or not we are going to go forward. Right. Um, Tricia, do you have any comments on it before we? No, um, no. we've had uh, two meetings. Florence has really done most of the homework, um, but it's been something we've been looking at for a while, and then for just lack of time to move this forward, we're finally ready for the next step. And as I explained in my memo, um, I think it's going to provide service throughout the whole community, seasonally and um, during the year, and it can come right off this cherry sheet. So the funding mechanism is something we're going to need to um, formalize once Gatcher formally accepts <coughs> us, but that's um, probably for a fall town meeting, maybe for the annual, depending on how soon they vote us in and we get the roots established. Sure. I'd just like to thank um, Pam and Florence. It's a long time coming. She put a lot of hours into it. <coughs> thank you. Hmm. No? Okay. I've Great. So at this point, you're looking for us just to say that we would like to join GATRA, yeah. and then at that point, we'll figure out all the logistics and all Absolutely. the details of it later. Mm -hmm. Great. No yep. further? No. Great. Can motion? I have a motion? Move that the Board of Selectmen vote the following. Town of Situate hereby requests to become a member of the community of the Greater Attleboro Taunton Regional Transit Authority, otherwise known as GATRA, in accordance with Mass General Laws Chapter 161, Capital B, as amended by Chapter 123 of the 2006 Economic Stimulus Bill. Second. Second by Mr. Norton. Um, any further discussion? Yes, sir. Yep. Tom Acosta from Camden Pass Lane. $116,000, what is that money that the town paid the MBTA or? We pay yeah. the state. We pay, the, yeah, the cherry sheet is a, uh, is kind of a uh, debit and credit trial balance that the state gives us money and we give the state money. So that's one of the payments that the town, every town makes to the state for um, transportation, you know, assessment. So what they're telling us now is that you can allocate that, you know, it's usually for buses and trains and T's, um, but what they're saying is we can allocate that to an alternative um, um, transportation method and that's what they're proposing. Is that the way I understand it? It kind of makes sense when you think about it. You know, if the money's going for, let's say, the train, let's face it, the train's not going to go anywhere. It, it ends here. And all they could do is reduce the, ser the, the services there and the timing, which they've been doing. But f certainly the community at large will get a better benefit out of, it, out of doing GATRA because we'll have our own local bus that will be going around to various sections of the town during times that we, we think are important, whether it's for uh, the elderly or um, seniors or whether it's for high school students or whether it's just people in general or, or visitors in the boating community. It's a, a really a good thing that can help the town of Situate and it's a, it's a benefit. Over the years we've probably given millions of dollars to the uh, state as our assessment. Uh, it's been hundreds of thousands of dollars each year for as many ye as years as I can uh, literally millions of dollars. And we've really got very little, if anything, in return for it. Uh, but so this was the first time that we were going to see something substantial that we could actually point to and say, "This is, we're finally getting something for our T assessment." So this is a great thing. Any other? Great. So we have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? It is unanimous. Ladies, thank you very much for your hard work, thank and you. thank you for coming in and presenting it. And we look forward to the next step. Okay, moving on to item number four. Sorry, it took so long. <coughs> which is um, a discussion vote, um, order of the taking of a betterment of a new public way on Persimmon Drive, Hickory Lane, and Beech Tree Farm Road. Mr. Banger. Thank you. Uh, this is an administrative matter following up on the uh, street acceptance work and the work at town meeting in the fall to accept the streets you mentioned, Persimmon Drive and Hickory Lane and Beach Tree Farm Road. Um, what you need to do now uh, after this, uh, up to this point, um, the property owners have petitioned the, the town for acceptance of the street. 
uh, seventy five percent of people as a minimum have signed that petition in terms of having their, their street being taken over by the town these streets need some upgrading to meet town standards uh, they have likewise seventy five percent at at a minimum in most cases hundred percent have agreed that they will pay the betterment for upgrading the street to the uh, town standard that was agreed upon and at this point in time since town meeting has uh, voted to accept this land as public streets and the layout that you prepared for them uh, what you need to do now is then make a motion that we uh, take by eminent domain a permanent easement on the layouts of those three streets and then secondly that we vote to adopt orders uh, for assessment of betterments for the purpose of making those improvements to those streets. So do you, are there any questions? You did this once before for the streets of the Springtown meeting. We'll do this uh, after every town meeting when we have new streets coming before us. And like Al said, all of these have gone through the whole street acceptance process. Is this the final step? This uh, other is, than the construction. Well, yeah, uh, other than the construction, what will happen? There is a, a once you make this vote, there's a notice sent out to everyone uh, that that everything is moving forward, and then we will begin uh, going out for bid to find someone who will uh, then make the betterments, improvements to the streets, and then following that, then you'll there'll be a couple more steps whereby the uh, treasurer and the assessor will uh, ask for a vote, and then think that, and then we'll get our money. Any questions from the board? Motion. Motion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, move the Board of Selectmen adopt orders of taking by eminent domain for permanent easements on the layout uh, on the layouts of Persimmon Drive, Hickory Lane, Beach Street, Farm Road, for the purpose of establishing such public ways on any apparent drainage and municipal service. Further move that the Board of Selectmen vote to adopt orders, plans, and estimates for the assessment of betterments for the purpose of making improvements to said ways and the amount not to exceed as follows for Seven Drive and Hickory Lane, $104,933, and Beach Creek Farm Road, $58,760. Second. Second by Mr. Harris. Further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? None. It is unanimous, four to nothing. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Al. Moving on to item number five. Um, this will be a uh, discussion on the South Shore Coalition. Ann Burbine is our representative there. Good Hi, evening. Ann. Good evening, gentlemen. Ann Burbine, your representative of the South Shore Coalition, as well as chairman of the Co South Shore Coalition. My purpose here this evening is to just bring you a little bit up to speed. Um, I met with uh, Michael uh, O'Dowd from Department of Transportation back in early December, along with Barry Keppard uh, from MAPC, concerning the Four River Bridge. And the Four River Bridge has been an erector set now for 10 years. Under, and it's going forward on the accelerated bridge program paid for with federal money. There have been, a, have been numerous public hearings concerning it. As a matter of fact, Thursday night there will be yet again another update from Michael O'Dowd in Hingham at the South Shore Coalition. And m my concern is the impact that this will have on communities south of the Four River Bridge because this construction will probably take three to four years. It's supposed to be completed by 2016. I'm not sure I believe that. And I don't mean to be cynical, but we have been waiting a very, very long time for this. It has passed the federal environmental, it's that FONSI, it's worked through that. Um, they're waiting for the in, um, Army Corps of Engineers in terms of widening and dredging. That money has to come out of Congress. Whether that will come forward or not remains to be seen. But I'm just really giving you all a heads up that this is in the offing and it will have an impact here for people that commute to Boston. I also find it more than fascinating, and this will be brought up at the South Shore Coalition, and I see that you have it on this evening's agenda about the possible demise of the boats and the bus routes. My concern is with the reconstruction of the Four River Bridge, what is going to happen in terms of transportation when there are no, there may not be any buses there may not be any boats, and this is something that will be asked 
by the South Shore Coalition. Letters will be written. I think you people are going forward to write letters. But it's more than just writing letters from the Board of Selectmen. It's trying to get a postcard campaign. I mean, this is very important to Situate and to the South Shore community. The other things that we will be looking at, along with transportation with South Shore Coalition, we're going to be looking into reviving village centers, parking, housing, as well as further transportation issues. But again, the erector set eventually will be going away. It's going to be, um, people want a drawbridge. I do not think that that will happen. It will be a 270 foot lift bridge that's supposed to go up 20% less than it is now. It all remains to be seen, so. <coughs> when, you, <coughs> when you mention the campaign, what exactly are you campaigning for? To keep boats, to keep buses in Weymouth, in Hingham. That's on our agenda. Okay, no, I understand Fair the ferry and, and that. Yes. But, but not, you're not against the construction no. of the bridge. No, it's really just the alternative transportation. Right. If w the bridge will go up, and pardon me if I did not make myself clear, the bridge is going to happen regardless. The issue is what happens with the disruption that this will cause if the MBTA goes forward and cuts back its transportation services. But you know, it's, I, I think it's a question that, that desperately needs to be asked. And it takes more than, I know it was on WATV the other morning that there was a 300 group meeting in Hull and they were putting together a petition to, and I believe Hedlund was there as well as our new rep, who will be Lynch, who we will be part of the 8th Congressional District as of now. He will be our new congressman if he wins re-election. And so he was there. They've signed a petition, but again, petitions are just lists. If we want any type of change, if we want to ensure that the buses remain, that the boats remain, if they can only figure out their funding, their financing, and their debt, which is part of this whole issue. We have to do postcards. We have, we all have to do it, not just a letter from, from you. And if you would like, and if you ha can have that letter together, I can present it to Michael O'Dowd Thursday evening, Great. if you would like me to. Any uh, comments or questions from the board? Nope. No? And thank you. <clears throat> this is one of those tough committees that it does a lot, but it's not always uh, the most exciting, but I thank you for putting your time into it and um, and keeping us surprised of what's going on there. Thank you. And um, do we have a time. letter? We'll talk about the uh, letter and get it to you in due time. Thank you. Okay. Um, before we go to the next item, which is uh, item six, which are the budget reviews, um, Representative Cantwell is going to come here at some point in time to talk about item number seven. So why don't we do some of the budgets, knowing that when he comes here, we're going to skip over to him for, for five or ten minutes and then get back to the budgets. Um, so um, why don't we get started? We can start with, uh, we'll go right down the list. We'll start with conservation. Give us a second to get our books out. Frank, Jim, how are you guys? How are you? Very good. Good. Um, the way we've started this is, if you'd like, just for a minute or 90 seconds, tell us a little bit about your goals, what you've accomplished, if you want to summarize anything like that before we jump into the numbers and stuff. Um, or, you know, some people have said their mission, you know, if you want to take a minute and just tell us what you're doing, what you want to do, and what you're trying and trying to keep doing. Yeah. Okay, uh, my name is Jim O'Connell. I'm the conservation agent and conservation department head. Uh, Frank Snow sitting beside me is the chairman of the Conservation Commission. Uh, the, uh, the, commission the Conservation Department has uh, three principal goals for the ne next coming fiscal year. One is to uh, continue to protect and enhance the beneficial functions of all our wetland resource areas, including salt marshes, barrier beaches, dunes, beaches, bordering vegetative wetlands, 
groundwater supply and so forth um, to, to protect and enhance their beneficial functions. And what I mean by the beneficial functions of all these resources is storm damage prevention, flood control, uh, protection of groundwater, protection of surface water, and, and, and uh, things such as that. So protecting basically the, the functions of those resources, not just the resources themselves. Goal one. Goal two um, is to um, continue to manage and hopefully uh, enhance um, the management of our open space and conservation areas, particularly the conservation areas that are under the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission. And number three is to continue uh, the Town of Situa's participation in the Federal Emergency Management Agency's community rating system. So if I can just briefly um, just outline a, a, a couple of few things we're going to do in each one of those goals. The first goal being to, to protect and enhance the beneficial functions of all our wetland resource areas for the protection of the environment and the protection of the people who live in town. Um, one, we're going to uh, conduct an educational, re uh, educational workshop um, probably in the spring, more likely in the summer when all the residents are here, and really describe what the role of the Conservation Commission is and the importance of these wetland functions to the people who reside in this town and the economic vitality by protecting all these wetland resource areas. So we're going to do a workshop. We're going to do a tri-fold brochure that we can hand to all the consultants and the applicants that come before us who really don't have a clear technical understanding of what we're really trying to do which is to protect the function of these resources really for the value of the properties in the town. So we're going to outline what the importance of, these, of our work and what these resource areas uh, actually provide to the residents of the town. Um, and uh, develop um, emergency, emergency regulations in, 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 in case we get uh, a sudden coastal or inland storm, which we obviously are going to uh, anticipate to happen. So that's under goal one. So we're going to do a lot of education outreach. Um, in the past year, we've uh, reviewed about uh, uh, 150, the past fiscal year, we've re reviewed approximately 150 projects and um, took 43 enforcement actions for illegal, uh, illegal activities within the wetlands or adjacent to them. So it's been a, it's been a pretty, pretty busy year. The department brought in, because of those uh, filings, about $40, $42,000 in the last fiscal year in terms of <coughs> processing um, those 150 filings and the enforcement orders. Uh, in terms of the open space uh, and conservation management, we don't, we're one of the few towns that I know that doesn't have a map that shows you where the conservation areas are. And when you know where the conservation areas are, the trail maps that can tell you and tell you how to navigate and enjoy some of these open space and conservation areas. So uh, we did put into the budget to, to um, hire uh, and work with an outside firm to map all the conservation open space areas that are available to the public and do trail maps for each one of them. I think that would be a tremendous benefit for people to actually enjoy all the efforts of people who came before me to accept gifts of land and to purchase some of these lands through community preservation and so forth. So that will be one of the major initiatives we'll do next year is actually to, to let people know where they are and, and how they can enjoy them. Uh, the third goal, uh, continue uh, Situate's participation in the Federal Emergency Management Agency's volunteer program, the Community Rating System. The Community Rating System is a volunteer program. Um, Situate has been participating in it for a number of years, uh, thanks to the works of, of, of past uh, conservation agents and, and members of the Commission. Um, at present, uh, because of our efforts, there are 17 activities that the Town of Situate um, complies with. Enhanced, um, enhanced regulations. In other words, in the wetlands regulations in the town of Situate, we require a, a floor to be elevated one foot above FEMA's predicted 100-year flood elevation. That gives us a certain number of points. When, uh, when the town purchases or accepts for gifts open space in the floodplain, that gives us a certain number of points. So there's a whole laundry list of things that give you a certain number of points. When you reach a certain level, you automatically gain uh, a class. Situate is a class eight. And what that means is that all the residents in the floodplain enjoy a 10% reduction in their flood insurance premiums. So it's, but it's basically the, the important part of the program, number one, is residents get to save money on their flood insurance premiums. But more importantly is all the extra efforts that the town, situate, uh, town of Situate is doing to help protect the resources and particularly to protect, to protect people and property from storms by taking these extra efforts. So we're going to continue participation in that um, in the community rating system. There's a new manual coming out. The manual is about 850 pages. There's a brand new manual coming out this year, which means that all of us are going to have the enjoyment of, of reading. The points have changed. So Situate 
we're, we're used to what the points are. We've been doing it for a number of years. Now the points have all changed. We're going to have to really jump into that and ensure that we continue to, number one, protect the residents from storms and floods, and two, let them enjoy a, you know, a reduction in their flood insurance premiums. So those are basically the three, the three top goals uh, that the Commission uh, will be working on this year. Great. Any questions? Just a comment, and that is uh, uh, obviously the three goals are, are admirable. That second goal about mapping and putting in trails potentially for uh, town conservation land is a phenomenal and a great idea for everybody at ComCom and, and Jim, you, and whoever. Uh, it's, it's, it's long overdue, and it's great. That, that'll be a really nice benefit and asset for the town. Yeah, that'll, that'll, be, that'll be a joint effort with a number of other boards and, and great individuals idea. in the to town. Great idea. Get it going. Great. I agree. Um, <coughs> Before we jump into um, step all my 90 seconds, <laughs> <laughs> well, you um, can deal with the numbers. First, they, if you know me, you get the hook. <laughs> uh, just two quick questions. There's two funds that conservation has. There's a conservation fund, and there's the driftway fund. Um, I know that um, some of them go to to deal with the spit in, in that area back there through the Audubon, and the other one uh, deals with uh, driftway park and the old estate and that sort of stuff. Um, what, do you know what the balances are on those funds? Or yeah. one almost like 24, 25. Uh, 25 and 31, I think. Jim, do you know? I thought there was only 12 in the population. I know there's 20, 31, I think, in the driftway. Yeah. So it's around 20 in, in each of them. And any any projects going on in those other than the normal maintenance stuff, or? We had done a few um, studies and some plans for the driftway area that were pretty aggressive. We've backed away from that a little bit, but mm -hmm. we still have things we'd like to continue to pursue. Um, you know, Jim outlined a lot of things that we'd like to do, and just I should add that we're thrilled that we now have um, a, an agent, um, a full-time or permanent agent on the commission, and, and I think we're moving in the right direction. We've been sort of stomping out fires for little bit of time, but I think with Jim's help, we're uh, being progressive this year. Great. In, so in terms of some of the funds of that, I mean, just an idea. I, I, I think I think we've been a little lax in, in maintaining a lot of the open space and conservation areas in terms of clearing the trails and some of the work and Frank and volunteers did in br building bridges over some of the areas that really make it inaccessible during during rain events or flood events. And I think some of that money does need to be used to clear clear and maintain some of these trails. But it's a limited it's a it's it's a limited budget, and the more we take out of it, will eventually be at zero. That's a, a one of the major concerns I think of the commission in terms of maintaining all our conservation and, and open space lands. So the only thing I, I suggest is <coughs> I know Eagle Scouts are always looking for projects like that as well. We I'm sure yeah, you're we in did touch that with them. With them. Um, the last Eagle Scout one was off of um, Whitcomb Pines. There was a young man that, that did a trail um, that was that runs from Clapper Road into Whitcomb Pines. So we. We do work with them, and, yeah. and it's worked out well. But um, those, again, those monies, if we combine those with some CPC, uh, you're aware that CPC can't do maintenance, but if we have a construction project or um, actually building some trail work on the, on the properties we've acquired, we've taken, we're moving along with it fairly quickly, but we want to make sure we get it right. We're going to also be taking in input on um, the addition of new trails on like the Wheelwright property and uh, some others that we've acquired that really enhance those two. Just, just before you move on, is there any way of, of extending or continuing the trail that's at Driftway Park to have it loop around to connect the north side of the, uh, the, the bike path? In other words, when you go into Driftway Park, it, it, it dead ends, you know, after you, you walk. Is there any way of looping it so that you can, you know, either way you access it, whether it's going south or going north on the or I guess you could say east or west, whatever it is, you could loop around instead of staying on the bike path. You could go off from Conservation yeah. Park to, to go somewhere, basically. It's, to me, it would make sense because then you could 
go out and see the, the, uh, the river. Yeah. And see the windmill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it does take it, like you said, <coughs> it does take you around to the back side of there, but it would be a short yeah. length that we could actually connect it. I think for a while there was some question about what might happen with that little piece that um, the, the uh, Parks Department was using as a nursery, but maybe that we know that how that's going to be used, we could pull that back out. Great, we'll jump right into the numbers real quick. Um, it's a relatively small budget. Last year, it was about $108,000. We'd hoped <coughs> it was a little bit bigger. <laughs> and this year, it is, as you said, a little bit bigger. It's about $116,000. Um, some of that is in the regular salaries, as you said, having full-time conservation. Um, out of technical services, I saw that went down, and some binding and printing, um, those went up. Hope, I assume to do some of the marketing stuff that you're talking about for the uh, um, for the maps and all these other things that you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, any uh, the technical services is that uh, consultants to do that you have to hire for projects or what is that? That's um, that's yes that's to hire outside consultants to <coughs> check on um, you know like uh, difficult boarding vegetated w wetland delineations that you know that's a real a real science right, right now right now um, Paul Shea has been the uh, the outside consultant working as the conservation agent I think as you know for about well over a year uh, he is a, a a specialist in inland wetlands boarding vegetated wetlands and so forth and um, he's the person that we've been been um, using and probably will 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 continue to provide it um, we can continue to do that but that that's principally for outside technical services that's beyond our technical capabilities. Great. Uh, yeah. Any other questions from the board? No. 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 Okay, well, we're not actually voting them tonight. We're just reviewing them and asking any questions. And then when all said and done, we make sure all the uh, numbers tie at the end, then we'll uh, vote them all one time. So um, if that's all the questions we have, thank you for coming in and presenting. And uh, good luck, Frank. Thank you. Thank you. Always a pleasure. <laughs> you know what? I see Jim out in the hallway, but let's try and get one more done before um, before we go over that. So, Stop. what department should we? Sure? Don't be brief. You I'm just two joking. Million. Chief Judge was chomping at the bit there, so we, he is next on the list. <coughs> so this is under public safety, 200, and the police and fire in there. Chief, thanks for coming in. Okay, you want to take your gentlemen. 90 seconds of... Uh, okay. Uh, my goal is not sex as a sexy as uh, conservation. Uh, I'm not building any trails or anything. And, uh, I don't think I'd say conservation issues are sexy either, <laughs> Rick. <laughs> uh, all right, well, well, first goal is uh, just to ensure that the town of Situate is uh, NIMS compliant. Uh, I don't know. I'm sure all of you have taken your NIMS courses. And by I have statute, mine. you are supposed to have uh, ICS 100 and 700. So we'll, I'm going to go through all of this this year and just to make sure. Because it's, uh, it's an online thing, you can do it. Uh, second one is just uh, to work with everyone to establish an emergency operations center, which we really don't have. I mean, basically, we have a closet that's a fire station with radios in it. That's, that's basically been our. our um, the other goals are just kind of housekeeping at the fire station. Uh, right, tra uh, training and um, yeah, reorganizing yeah, the, offices the offices and, and right. mostly making sure there's no fires in town and yeah, it's a safe community. Best. Right. Uh, um, yeah, just a couple of the things that came, you know, you've got some aging equipment there that we're dealing with too, we're going to have to deal with over the next couple of years. And one thing that really stuck out to me is that um, last year, the whole department went through without a serious injury. Mm -hmm. And I think that says a lot to you and the captains and everyone below you that keep the people safe. And it's particularly given some of the storms that we've had here. And we've seen the heroic stuff that you guys have done in terms of stuff down on uh, Sand Hills. And, um, you know, that's a great thing to be proud of that everybody got through it without any injuries. So, thank you. Um, before we jump into the numbers, any any other comments on <coughs> on the goals and the um, initiatives of the fire department? All right. Nope. Nope. Then we will plug forward. Um, 
Another thing that stuck out to me, you, you listed your uh, revenue um, areas as well, and that the ambulance um, service that we provide, you know, brings in 700 plus thousand dollars a year, which is great. That goes to the uh, local receipts and goes through the whole budget process, but that has uh, been a good decision years ago when we expanded that, so kudos to that. And now we'll get, uh, jump right into the numbers. Um, last year's budget was <coughs> a little bit over $4 million. And this year's budget is a little bit over $4 million. So it's, it's relatively flat. Um, you know, there's, there wasn't really anything that stuck out a ton. It looks like we took some of the repair, you know, water sewer and split it up between a couple of accounts, but um, everything is relatively in line with, with what last year's appropriations mm -hmm. were. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's, it's pretty much a level funded budget. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you list all of the positions and um, there's a vacancy that I think you're, did you hire or you're going through the process well, yeah, now? Well, we, we have one hired, he's in the, um, he's in the fire academy now. And uh, we have one just waiting to go and wait for him to get out of the academy to bring this other, this new, new person on. And then we're still one short, but right. you know, uh, we're working on it. Working that during the year. Yeah, I mean, that's kind of been the issue with, um, actually we ran into it this year. You know, I mean, I don't know, the overtime seems high, we did get, 50,000 with the override right year. but by hiring the new the new guys they're basically eating up that money because they're we're paying them but they're either at the academy or they're they're training I mean they're not able to count to a shift strength yet so it usually takes about six months before you can count them to sh shift strength so we're going to be spending that money like this week I went to um, I had to drop down to nine the night on duty. Normally we run 10 is our minimum, mm -hmm. but um, just because I'm running out of overtime money, so I did that. But unfortunately, doing that, I can't run the second ambulance because we just don't have the manpower to do it. So mm -hmm. um, hopefully we can uh, we can make make up the difference by doing that, and hopefully we don't have to uh, look to like close the station or something. Yeah. So, well, Chief, we uh, when is Firefighter Kent going to be on shift? I think he has like three weeks left at Boston. As soon as he comes out, we're going to put him on so a shift. So three weeks for him, and then when does Mr. Bowman start? Mr. Bowman will start. Uh, he's months? taking his PAT in um, like two weeks. So by July 1, he should have both of them. Well, he'll have Mr. Bowman too. Right, okay. hopefully, yep, we can get okay. him on. So this is fiscal year 13, starts in July 1, right. so we should be up. Right. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. You know, we, we That's the that. hope. Right. Yep. Great. Any questions? No. No. Nope. Great. Well, thank you very much okay. uh, well, for coming you. in. Thanks, Rick. Um, and uh, again, we're not voting anything right now, but it'll all be <coughs> passed at the end. Thank Thanks, Chief Judge. <coughs> um, we have to number seven now. We can't wait. Is that right? So, yeah. So right. Yeah. Is, um, is Jim Cantwell in the hallway? Yeah, if you don't mind. Jim, how are you? Great, thank you. Hey. Representative, good to see you. Oh, we're not stopping for you. Oh, good, good. <laughs> we wanted you to hear all the budgets. <laughs> um, as I said before, we're going to just uh, take a couple minute break from the budgets and go over. Um, some discussion on the MBTA and the Hingham Ferry Services. Um, Representative Cantwell has been to some meetings on that, had a few things to talk about. Sure. So I'll give you the floor for a couple minutes and then we'll we'll pipe in and go from there. I'm going to stay standing so I won't take any more of your time than we need to. I, I just, I, I got an email from the board. Just if I can, Zach, can you hear him and can you get him on TV? Sorry, Jim, just so that everybody can watch you. We don't want you to see you from your, from the, Sit down, your shoulders you down. Yeah. <laughs> on TV. <laughs> <laughs> um, I appreciate that the, the board, I, I, I received some correspondence just with the concern uh, about the proposal to eliminate the subsidy for our, our community votes uh, out of Hingham and, by the way, out of Hull as well. Uh, so I, I just called and said I'd be very happy to come in and just speak for a minute just about the current information. By the way, Al Bangert already gave uh, the, the best synopsis, so the board already has all the information in front of you. Uh, just uh, the fact back in 2000, 
The state had hoped that we would take care of the financial needs of the T by forward funding, uh, by giving out of uh, our sales tax, giving of the 6.25 percent, 1 percent goes just to the T to try to pay for our transportation needs. Um, we took uh, just two years ago, we also did some additional funds to try to make sure that we'd right the ship. However, uh, the T still has uh, for heavy debt, uh, the T, about one third of the T's operations right now, one third of the money is just paying debt service. Uh, they've been deferring uh, maintenance for so long that it's really coming to roost now. Uh, parenthetically, by the way, we all know with the big dig, um, back now 12 years ago, there was a, a representation that the big dig was on time and under budget. It was neither. Um, you know, the state, it, there was a 10, check that, a $1 billion bond that was floated to try to pay for big dig expenses. The presentation was it would be paid off with incremental increases of tolls over that 10 year period of time. Never happened. When I came into office, one of the first things we were told is that that bond now 10 years had passed and we had to pay it. It was over $2.3 billion of debt. So those are the kind of, of things that we're dealing with now. Uh, in fairness to the folks on the T, we have some terrific folks who are there who are trying to come up with a $167 million budget gap, trying to, to come up with ways to pay for that. And um, some of the, the solutions are things that we will need to speak out uh, with a loud voice at the upcoming hearing. Um, some of the proposals that you have before you, there are two options for how they would try to take care of that budget gap. None of it is great news. Uh, it's talking of having our, our uh, costs increasing for commuter rail. Uh, it could be up to $9.75 each way. Um, what I'm encouraging people and in, in what I wanted to offer to the board was that I understand perhaps the board w was going to send us correspondence, which I uh, uh, clearly want to, to take to the hearing. I'd uh, be pleased to speak with uh, uh, whomever would come in and uh, appear on behalf of the board. But people watching tonight, if they want to send us their testimony of how important uh, the service is, both the, the commuter rail service and for commuter boats, we would want to, to bring that forward at the hearing. It's uh, February 8th at 6 p.m. at Hingham Town Hall. Uh, I would note, by the way, Garrett Bradley and Bob Headland have really been leading this, uh, where it's right in Hingham. Uh, I'm happy to be meeting with both of them and talking of how we can act as a region. Um, we just, uh, the general manager for the T just announced today he's going to come on February 3rd to ride with us, to ride on, on the, uh, the ferry to talk to people about how important it is to them and to see what we can do to maintain a subsidy. Uh, if the subsidy is not maintained, essentially every ride will go from $6 to a little over $9 uh, per ferry ride. Um, so that's information I have thus far. Uh, I appreciate that you have the budgets tonight. I'd be happy to sit back and listen on budget material too, but I, I wanted to come in and speak for a minute or two to you. Now, Jim, you mentioned they can get in touch with you. Do you want them to send correspondence here or to you directly? Uh, I'll, you know, I'll give you my email for everyone, uh, and then, Mr. Chairman, however you'd prefer. Yeah. Um, my email is james.cantwell, which is C-A-N-T-W-E-L-L, -L, at mahouse.gov. Whatever people email to me, I'll, I'll put in a packet when I do my testimony on the 8th. Uh, and if people need a phone number, it's 617-722-2140. Great. Or you can always send it here, and, and Kim, um, whoever gets it here, will we'll forward it on to you. Um, <clears throat> just we can expand on that for a second. I think um, it's important that people understand that the ferry is an important um, method of transportation for people from Situate. Um, we've supported it over the years. We continue to support it. Um, I don't know that it would be canceled, but as uh, uh, Representative Cantwell said, um, the subsidy that the state pays the independent operator um, they're, they're suggesting that they would eliminate that. So right. it's about $2.80 something cents per ride that the, the operator gets subsidized by the state, and that is one of the cost cuts they're trying to do to make up for that $160 million gap. Um, so, like you said, potentially the ride cost would go from approximately $6 to approximately $9. Um, and again, we support the use of it. It's used quite a bit. And um, you know we'll write some sort of letter um, for you to take that shows how important it is to our community and whatever they can do to help right. would, would be greatly appreciated. Um, any other, Joe? Jim, if I may, you know the the uh, I, I know it's been mentioned about the weekend service, and I'm right. sure you've heard of this. Um, you know the T continues to lose money, but yet they also continue to do things that cause them to lose money. Right, right. And you have a you have a service that goes out of on the Greenbush line, and I'm sure it's probably on every communal line in the state, uh, on weekends, four trains or five trains in and out, whatever it is, and for all practical purposes, they're empty. Okay. 
they were absent. When I say empty, they're empty. Right. You won't find three people leaving Greenbush Station on a, any one of those trains. And I guess <coughs> my point is, uh, I mean, is that being looked at to cut that out? It is. Because, I mean, it's just, it, we would hate to see a valuable service like the, like the ferry boat. Right. Uh, the subsidy taken away from them, and yet continue with these foolish practices that they continue to do. Uh, the further they go in debt, I mean, the more lines they want to build, and, and we all know that it's a losing proposition. Right. And, and Joe, I remember you made that recommendation, and I think the board, I don't know if the board had voted, but, but I remember early on us coming in and talking about weekend service, how very few people rode. Indeed, with your request, I had looked into whether or not they could just run you know, the, the main locomotive in one car and they cut the others uh, and just to save the wear and tear. And they said just the cost of decoupling them and putting them back together made that cost prohibitive. But the, the bottom line was if we're making difficult decisions, you're absolutely right, that, that the weekend service, it was eliminated while they were working on the, the uh, concrete railroad ties. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't know if the board got many phone calls. Uh, I, I checked with the T about that they had one call complaining. Uh, and, and I had very little myself. I don't uh, think we had any. Right. Uh, so, I mean, so that tells, speaks to what we're in, in an ideal world, to build up uh, ridership, we, we, we would want to make sure that we would have it running as often as possible, but, but if we're making difficult decisions about cuts, I, I, I think you're probably right. I think that that would be a place. If, if we had a choice between eliminating weekend service and coming up with some other alternative and keeping the ferry, that, that seems to me to be a pretty uh, common sense uh, compromise. I was just going to make a comment. On, I haven't really been into the <coughs> Hingham Park area, but I mean, just look at the community that has been built, and right. I would say in large part because right. of the <coughs> easy access into Boston. And uh, you're absolutely right, Sean. I, I think, you, yeah. I was just going to say, and if, if that subsidy is gone, I remember the first commuter boat that left Hingham, and that person tried to do it without a subsidy, the first high-speed <coughs> commuter boat, right. and he couldn't really do it, and then the others came along, and they were subsidized, and, and look what it's done. Right. I think Ann said it, or somebody said that, you know, go through the parking lot, and there are tons and tons of situate stickers on those cars. They absolutely are. And, and you raised a terrific point, that when we're part of our thing of smart growth, when we want to try to give incentives so people <coughs> will do growth that will make use of mass transit, that was a promise. And it was one of the covenants is that we would keep the subsidy for that area to help that area grow. And uh, that was, I know, a comment of Peter Foreman from the Social Chamber and others who said, once you make that promise and we build around it, we need to maintain it. So I, I'm sure that, that uh, I appreciate you reminding me of that because I'll put that into my comments for the 8th as well. Uh, other than it's extremely disappointing. I mean, it's, uh, I'm, I'm you know, preaching to the choir, but it's just, you look at this and if they go up in the prices, you begin to say, all those people are going to say, fine, I'll get into the car. If I want to spend $10 a day driving, that's a gas for maybe two or three days. And then, you know, the prices for not just the, the monthly pass, but then also the parking makes sense to just drive into Boston. Right. And, and, it fits and everything that the whole it runs contrary to You absolutely runs contrary it's to really the policy we want to get people off uh, the roads. Yeah. Right. So I, I, I would imagine, and, and I'd, I'd be happy to come back with, uh, not on a budget night, but we'll come back on a night when we can report on, on our state budget uh, as well as how we're doing it with this, because the new policy will take effect July 1st. I think it's interesting, in one sense, earlier, Jim, we're talking about Catra coming to the town of Citrus, right. which is actually a great thing. It is a great thing. And yeah. then later in our meeting, we're talking about how doggone it, you know, <laughs> we're going to be losing services and transportation. Four, two, right. It's exactly it. So. Right. And I wanted to th on the Gatra, I wanted to thank Trish because I know it's been uh, been a lot of work, a long time going to try to make sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and, and we already it, it's we already are paying for a service, so we should be bringing it. So I appreciate the leadership. Sorry to come out of order, but I appreciate the chance to come. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. <coughs> Great. Mr. Chairman, we'll be writing a letter, will we? Yes. Okay, thank you. And you need that by February 8th, you said, Chip? Thanks. All right, why don't we, uh, the next one on the list is the Police Department. It's our Chief Stewart right there. Right there. You blend it right in. So if you, if you want to take 90 seconds and run through your accomplishments or goals or you want to jump right into it. Okay, you looking for the uh, FY13 goals? Yeah, or uh, there's no real, I mean, if, if there was anything specific that was done this year or anything specific that you're trying to get done next year that you want to. Uh, uh, all right, why don't we talk about, we'll talk about last year's and, and uh, <coughs> what we accomplished. Uh, 
issues. One was to uh, review, rewrite, update as necessary the uh, department rules and regulations. Um, it's actually in the current fiscal year here. We're working on that. Actually, I've got uh, uh, regulations from three departments that have been accredited, and we're going over those. In uh, you know, in the not too distant future, we should be able to come up with uh, uh, with a new set of rules for our department. Uh, uh, one of the goals was to provide more specialized training. Uh, uh, we've sent people to several specialized training. Uh, one thing we're responsible now for is, is our own breath test uh, training, which is something new, and it's an additional cost that uh, we uh, put back to us. Uh, in February, we're going to send some people to a field training officer at the school uh, so that we can t train uh, some new officers. Um, we continue sending people to... Uh, firearms instructors to uh, uh, armorers in, in the uh, firearms training. Uh, we send an officer to licensing, uh, uh, firearms licensing training. Uh, we actually uh, sent some people to train the trainer. Uh, so we're going to do some of our uh, own some munitions training in-house. And uh, actually we're going to send some people next month three sergeants to sergeants uh, leadership training. Um, I, I know. Outreach to community <coughs> groups, uh, that's one. We've actually just uh, got back into a domestic violence grant with the uh, district attorney's office. We used to have, we used to be involved in that, money dried up. Uh, we've now got an advocate that comes to our station uh, twice a week. We'll meet with victims of domestic violence. Uh, they've actually, uh, we met with them last week. There's a, uh, a young lady that's a, uh, an interpreter that should we need an interpreter in the middle of the night or something, we can uh, reach out to her. And um, actually the uh, Social Women's Resource Center will, will now make uh, advocates available to us in emergency situations. And it, it, it actually takes a lot, uh, takes care of a lot of work that we would have had to do as far as follow up and so forth. And, and, uh, it actually works out pretty good. They uh, review all our reports and um, uh, higher risk situations. They'll look at the end of those. Uh, right. I know just a few other things that came to mind to me was <coughs> um, on your goals. You know, develop again the training and the uh, enforcement of the laws and healthcare, but also to look into the establishment of a centralized dispatch center. I know that's that's being worked on between the two. Um, departments dealing with the efficiency of tracking and statistical stuff which is <coughs> also a goal of the fire department you know to keep up to date on the statistics so we can give that information back to the town and um, and let them know you know what's going on in the town in terms of fire and, and police work one of the things I think it really worked out uh, very well was to expand and increase efforts to address dangerous and Ill illegal uh, July 3rd and 4th activity mm -hmm. uh, with the fire department State Police, the DPW, uh, the Fire Marshal's Office. Actually, I think last July 3rd is probably the best we've had in a long, long time. Right. Hopefully, uh, we continue the trend. I, I'd circuit that as well. That was <coughs> a big accomplishment. I think the people in Hummer Rock appreciated that a lot. Um, <coughs> I'm just moving along quickly to the revenue sources. We obviously work hard on getting a lot of grants. Um, to do some of the different programs that you have. It looks like about $160,000, of which, you know, there's a, a, a little bit of parking fines and other other fees and stuff associated in that too, but um, that obviously takes time and energy as well. Um, <coughs> we can dive into the numbers. Last year, your budget was um, $3.33 million, and this year it's uh, $3.43 million. Um, the majority of that increase is in uh, regular salaries and the, uh, I think the override Correct. funded a couple of uh, new positions as well as the contractual obligations. Um, equipment went down a little bit, um, but other than that, it's a relatively flat budget. Um, the only other thing I noticed is that you have 
um, five vacancies and I know you're in the process of filling some of those now mm -hmm. I think there's four vacancies in the um, just regular officers yeah. and then there's a sergeant vacancy as well, well we carry that I mean it isn't another officer right. it's just if one were to be go up to but I mean this is still funded for uh, 32 total officers we actually interviewed a number of officers uh, candidates for a police officer a lot of the various last week and some really pretty good candidates in the group uh, good any other uh, questions from from the board no no I, I don't have any other um, thank you for coming in and presenting and, and going over stuff uh, we're not going to vote any of the budgets tonight we're going to wait till we get them all and make sure everything balances and then um, <coughs> move forward from there Good. so thank thanks you. again chief thank you Brian um, the next budget we'll move on to is uh, animal control Kim, how are you? Good, thanks. How are you doing? Good. If you want to uh, take a second and give 90 seconds of what you do and what you what you try and do and what you're. What is that for? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the only um, budget item there is for the shelter expense. Is that correct? Right. It's $6,900, and it's a, uh, an agreement we have with the animal shelter. Kim. Uh, salary is, is under our budget. Right. So what happens is uh, in return for uh, us being able to take any animals that we uh, have in our custody or uh, up to the animal shelter, we have an agreement with them to pay for uh, snow removal, removal, rubbish pickup, and uh, some landscaping, cut the grass, and so forth, uh, $6,900. <coughs> Yep. In exchange for that, the shelter is available to the police department 24-7. Um, they also provide many, many services to the town, including a rabies clinic. We have a spay-neuter clinic. Um, we have a trap-neuter release program. We have a help program for the elderly. Um, many things that I take advantage of every day. Right. Um, so I, I think it's a, it's a good deal for the town. And we're celebrating 20 years, actually, this year. So. Great. And you'd be surprised. I used to be the liaison. And yes, you go, yes, go to your you meetings, were. and you'd be surprised how many animal issues <laughs> there are in a small town like this. I think, Sean, are you do, who does it now? <laughs> and there are some wild stories. So, um, so it's also very rewarding, though. So. It is, but you work hard. I mean, it's it's uh, it's a difficult thing to deal with because there's conflicts constantly, and and you're right in the middle of it. So, well, I feel privileged to be able to do it. So, but, well, thank you for your work. Yeah. Um, any other questions from the board? No. Nope. Nope. Keep up the good nope. work, and. Uh, We'll see you guys shortly. Thank, Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, the next one, uh, we're going to skip the next one because Kim's going to be here till the end. Um, and why don't we go to veterans? That's me too. So why don't we'll you skip that one. IT and then the rest will be me. Great. Sheila. So we'll go right to IT. Bill, how are you? I'm well. Yourself? Well, thank you. Hi, Bill. Give us one second to turn the page. There it is, 155. All right, 90 seconds. You've done a lot. There's a lot you want to do. We all read it. So, so give us two or three highlights of, uh, of what you want to get done, And because I know that, obviously, it's a new position. It's, uh, well, thank you. Um, so I'll start with our new position, new department. Um, our mission statement is to leverage technology to meet the goals and needs of the business, this being government, both tactically and strategically by expanding services and achieving economies of scale through network connectivity, application availability, and optimization. So in line with that, the last year was spent kind of planning and where appropriate and available implementing um, portions of the mission statement. Better connectivity, um, lowering costs, gaining economies of scale, standardization, things of that nature. Um, for the upcoming fiscal year, the goals are to continue to improve di digital communication between offices. Uh, currently, the offices are separate and disparate, so I want to 
essentially use technology to bring all the remote offices, council meetings, and the block, other master, fire department, police department, well, uh, police department's already connected, <laughs> together in a more succinct manner. So we can then leverage out uh, uh, solutions that we can, uh, enterprise type solutions. So with, we can't get that without connectivity. Um, additionally, kind of increase security, um, allow some of our infrastructure has been replaced over the past year um, to a more flexible infrastructure, uh, virtual infrastructure, um, to allow, for example, the school system to connect to the financial applications securely. Um, currently, it's not as secure as I would like it to be. Um, adding uh, managed wireless networks. So <laughs> Also deploy where applicable um, multifunction printers to um, reduce overall printing costs and uh, have a higher standard of operational costs. Um, so that when a printer you know, breaks, we don't just go out and buy a new one. We have a four-hour response time from a, a vendor to come and fix it or replace it within four hours. So we've already implemented that solution at several offices. I want to continue doing that going forward. 90 seconds. Good job. <clears throat> well, as you know, better than any of us, over the last 200 and 375 years, you know, the IT department has just been band-aid together with a little expertise here, a little not so much expertise there, and you've, you've really taken control and taken an inventory of what we have. And obviously it takes money to fix it where you want it to, so we've got to pick our projects and, and uh, you know, steadily move forward and, and you've done a good job of that so far and obviously you plan on continuing it, so um, want to jump into the numbers any sure um, what's anyone has a comments last year the appropriation was hundred and eighty six thousand dollars this year it's uh, two hundred and forty one thousand um, dollars the majority of that increase is um, equipment over twenty thousand dollars of additional equipment which we just talked about in order to improve things, you need to buy the technology. Um, Thirteen thousand dollars of that is maintenance agreements. So on the equipment that we're buying, you're getting these service plans behind it so that it's supported. I assume. And then the technical services area of it, um, that's gone up about twenty thousand dollars. I don't know. Is that fall in line with with support as well, or? Yeah, a lot of that's carry over from existing services. Um, however, we're going to expand in some areas. For example, uh, offering access, read-only access to the assessor's database online, leverage that over a website. Um, uh, what else do we have along those lines? Uh, let's see here. Yeah, that's some replacement equipment. Oh yeah, uh, the addition of um, online dog licensing as well uh, to integrate with our um, uh, owner database, assessor's database. Um, same kind of is there any way, or is there any plan for the future of like online <coughs> beach sticker to avoid having to have people come into town hall <laughs> during the summer months to do something along that line, at least in the future, Bill? I believe there, uh, via Unibank, uh, you are able to, um, in certain instances, procure transfers and beach stickers. Uh, we have this past year um, taken a, a, our beach and transfer sticker program, and, and now it is actually a program uh, hosted internally here. However, um, the, the way the program is designed, it's not able to be leveraged online, and that's where the, uh, the other Unibank solution comes in. So you can buy your beach and transfer <coughs> station t station tickets online now. What we're doing now is, you know, that paper process to get your beach sticker? Yep. That's all been automated for going into this year. So the paper process <coughs> should pretty much 
So when you come in now, we can look you up. And that's you, you mail of people out the sticker? Field, people can have their stickers mailed out. Um, they can come in. They can have them mailed out. They can get them at rec registration. They can get them in the collector's office at any time. So we're trying to make them available lots of different places. But um, we're really the paper process for the stickers in terms of people filling it out and then getting that in a database is going to be automated now. Very good. Well, um, clearly the budget's gone up some, but you know this was for the last couple of years been one of the main initiatives of the board and of the <coughs> administrator to get us up in an area that we really have been behind the time. So um, that's why it is where it is. Any other comments? No. Good job. Thank you, Bill. Yeah, thank you, Bill. Thank you. I can. Sheila? Uh, the town administrator? Uh, no, just administration. Yep. Hi, Sheila. Hello. How are you? Good, thank you. Speaking of processing all that paperwork for everything. Um, you want 90 seconds to tell people what you do? Um, <laughs> sure. Or do you want me to run through it? Uh, no. Um, this particular budget administration, um, it, my role is to provide support to the town administrator's office and um, services to residents in a professional, courteous, timely manner. Also to work cooperatively with municipal <coughs> employees, elected officials, and board and committee members resolving problems in imp implementing policies and procedures. Great. Um, and that deals with all these little things that, that Bill has been talking about technologically wise. If there's ever something that we have to get done in town and we don't know who to give it to, typically it falls on Sheila's desk until we figure out what to do. So um, we can jump right to the numbers. Um, the budget is basically flat except for this big $30,000 increase in training, which it was none last year. Um, do you want to explain what that, that line item's for? Uh, the town administrator put um, training of, of um, police and fire into the administration budget. The, the fourth staff training is in the town administrator budget, and then she put this into the administration budget. Okay. So previously, last year, it was all in one budget. And the reason why there's zero last year is because we've broken it up into two different areas. And this is it's override funds. And this is all uh, funded through the override. It was one of the things to increase the training of the personnel in the town. Um, the telephone bills in here, um, supplies, print, I assume that's for the whole town hall. Right. And then there's only a part-time salary in here. Um, that increased a bit. The, um, Administrative office. Right. Right. So it's uh, last year was forty nine thousand. This year it's seventy nine thousand, and the thirty of it is the training that came from the other department. Great. Any questions from the board? Nope. 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 Other than say thank you, you do a great job there. You get much more. Uh, the right word negative grief. feedback grief right <laughs> more <laughs> from, grief from and people than than you get recognition and um, we appreciate the work you do thank you Shannon um, Kim you want to uh, step to the uh, front and center front and center hello now I'm not going to ask you to read all of our goals because there's far too many of them. But you are the glue that keeps us all together. Um, and if there's anything in particularly projects or something you want to say that you're working on that we hope to accomplish next year, go right ahead and, or. Well, most of the, the goals uh, are really administrative ones. Uh, we're continuing to improve um, our, uh, licensing databases. We've just um, concluded doing that for the alcohol licenses uh, and did an Excel spreadsheet and updated that and put all the info in. It's, it's a really good tool to use. We're now, um, for FY13, 
a goal is to do that for the non-alcohol licensing database. Uh, also, uh, there are some improvements that are going to be made to our uh, licensing renewal letters. They haven't been uh, updated in quite a few years. Uh, we want to do a sort of check system that will make it easier for people to respond. So we're excited about that. And we haven't looked at the Selectman's Policy Book in a lot of years, so that's going to be something big for FY13. So those are the major things. Great. And one other thing that I know you're working on also is all this um, vendor licensing and all that sort of stuff that we're working on. Yeah. will actually be 2012. Right. But again, all these little projects that come down the, the, the path that need to be done, either Kim or Sheila are the ones that end up doing all the grunt work on it. So, um, as well as the minutes for all the meetings and all this sort of stuff. Um, we can jump right into the numbers. Um, last year's budget was $217,000, and this year's budget is $215,000, so relatively flat. Um, some of the bigger items on this are uh, the legal bills of the, for the town fall into our <coughs> department. Um, about 130,000 of that 215 are litigation and legal service issues, um, and uh, salaries, uh, a part-time and a full-time person, and then um, the big money that we get. Um, can't speak about it other than some other binding and postage and that sort of stuff. Any questions from any of the line items? No. Great. Um, and it appears, you know, it's always a, it's always difficult to uh, figure out what our legal expenses are going to be for the year because you never know what court cases are going to come down the pike. But um, this year we're we're on track and we're doing pretty well. And I don't know if we, I mean, you never know, but I don't see any huge litigation issues on the horizon right now. But um, so there's no reason to increase those line items. And just as a comment on that, I know since we changed to council. Um, not that that had anything to do with the cost, but certainly our present council has been doing a great job, you know, minimizing uh, legal costs for the town, and that's one of the things that they had presented to us when they interviewed, and we decided to change. So, you know, it's nice to see that number going down, and um, hopefully, I mean, it will never go away, unfortunately, but it's nice not that it's a high number like 100,000 or 200,000 the way it's been a few years back. So it's right. nice. Great. All right, Kim, thank you very much. Thanks, Kim. <coughs> and now why don't we run through um, the last five of them for, uh, why don't we start with the uh, veterans all right what's the number on that yeah, one right. oh, I'm sorry it's uh, no. five forty three five four three perfect, perfect. there you go thank you Well, as anyone that's read the paper in the last couple of months, we've uh, expanded our veteran services. Um, and with that, the expenses have gone up a little bit. Um, we have a full-time uh, veteran service agent in Hingham, and we will be hiring a part-time one here as well as the administrative person here. Um, I think that's the main change in the personnel aspect. And then... Um, the other thing is our expectation of the expenses that we'll be paying out to veterans has gone up, so we've budgeted an increase from $50,000 to $80,000 on those lines. Um, overall, the budget has gone from $94,000 to $136,000. Um, Trish, were there any any high things you wanted to highlight, or I mean, it's pretty. No, I mean, our total appropriation FY11 was 55000 so Tony, as you noted, for FY13, it's now at 137000 This reflects all the costs um, we are going to owe to the Town of Framingham Veterans Services District, which was approved last week by the state. So um, that agreement calls for a 55-45, 44% cost sharing. And that's what this budget reflects. The town's directly responsible for grades and markers, and also the actual subsistence um, claims that we get reimbursement of Commonwealth 
75% basis, except that's generally in the arrears of almost a year. Um, so we have, as of today, seven cl active claims, which is already uh, almost doubled from two, three months ago when we started the new process. So the $80,000 we hope will get us through FY13, but we're really projecting out for a while. So we'll see how we make out this year, and then hopefully that can inform us for FY13. We might make some additional adjustments in the fall. Comments? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Why don't we move on to um, uh, town administrator? His number one, two, three. Right after select three. Um, I have a question. Who put the request in for FY thirteen? Department request. Sheila. Okay. <laughs> Because you cut I know, it. it looks like I, <laughs> yeah. I thought you were going to step up and say you cut your own budget. That's all. Yeah, Sheila does the draft, so I don't think. Okay. okay. Do you want to run through what your <coughs> um, the goals, or do you want me to? Or I mean, she literally has over a hundred goals here for accompl accomplishment. So um, you got ninety seconds. So the first page is goals for FY13, and some of them you've touched on already, and they are in harmony, I think, with the goals the board's established, which is to continue to do our system-wide improvements in technology. Um, also want to continue to improve the personnel function. I'll be talking later tonight uh, in my report about a grant we are applying for today um, to help with that. The, the second major initiative is the public facilities, which we've talked to around. Um, the gates feasibility, the ESCO project, the use of land, the um, need for better management of our facilities in terms of maintenance and repair around the facilities manager position. Um, and then the one that's always going to be ongoing, which is um, just to continue to make sure that we have a stable financial um, future and to build up the reserves and be um, fiscally prudent in the choices we make for not only our operating budget, but for our capital. And um, the last one is really to, as we're all going to be learning, is how the effects of the solar array and the wind turbine are going to be managed in the revenues distributed and things like that. So those are the FY13 goals. Great. <coughs> and I'll just touch on a few of the uh, accomplishments, you know, financially. Um, everything's balanced, and our free cash number has risen to um, from negative numbers to um, over a million dollars. That's a big plus. Um, the personnel side of things, settling the contracts, which have probably taken up about you know 50 percent of your time over the last several years. Um, the Tosca contract settled, the police contract is settled, um, and those are big accomplishments. And then um, a lot of the usage in the ESCO. Um, programs that we have going on and the solar array and the uh, wind turbine, all those initiatives that are going on are, are great accomplishments for the town also. So, um, we run to the numbers now. Um, last year's budget was uh, 367. This year's budget is 345. Um, included in that are um, uh, part of the reason it went down was because that the last budget that was here where there was $60,000 in support and training, 30 of that got moved to another department, so now there's only 30 in this. Um, and that's the major difference between, you know, why it went down instead of up. It went up uh, due to um, salary increases, the collective bargaining legal expense are in um, the town administrator's budget, and um, that has stayed relatively flat with last year. And that's about it, other than conferences, postage, and all the regular sort of things. Right. The main thing with the town administrative budget is um, around legal services, legal bargaining, contract bargaining, contract adjustments for both union and non-union staff. 
that's all in this budget and right. this guidance. So, um, you so know, if you look at litigation relative to any personnel issues, right. those kinds of right. things. But as a as a citizen, if you look at the legal budget of the town, you have to look in two different departments. You have to look in the selectmen's department for uh, non labor litigation type stuff in this department for litigation type items any comments from the board no no great we'll move on to the next one insurance um, insurance which is in the 192 900. nope 192 oh, 192 Jim you're not leaving on insurance are you no, I, I get <laughs> that's a great topic <laughs> <laughs> Um, insurance it's uh, one line item it last year it was our, our premiums were four hundred and twenty five thousand dollars and this year it is at four hundred and ninety five thousand dollars an increase of seventy thousand dollars do you want to explain what that is yes that's um, an estimate uh, we're going out to bid for insurance next month so um, I anticipate that our renew uh, you know whatever we're quoted will increase due to some losses due to the storm but also um, for a variety of other things that I would like to increase maybe the lines of limits, but I anticipate that we're gonna at least have a $70,000 increase, maybe more, which is why you know the budget tends to be a little conservative at this point if I have to allocate a little more, but we'll know that in March. And also as you start adding technology, uh, buying new vehicles, uh, taking new properties, all those need to be insured and your premiums obviously increase as you add items to it. Any questions? Unemployment. That is 913. Actually, why don't we do workman's comp first, 912. <clears throat> this is another fun line item. It's uh, our workman's comp insurance. It's We are uh, self-insured. And when someone gets workman's compensation, um, it comes out of this line item. In 2012, we appropriated $190,000. In 2013, the recommendation is $257,161. So if you look at the trend history um, <coughs> on the detail sheet where it says we expended $285,000, um, that's this has been a historical trend in this town where we have been spending more than um, we actually appropriate every year. So a town meeting uh, a year ago, we changed the, um, the way the fund was structured so that any surplus we might have in it doesn't get closed out in every year as it was before. You may remember last June, we had a surplus identified in the health insurance line item. Um, 85,000 of that was moved into the workers' compensation trust fund. As my narrative here says, um, that fund balance should be around $750,000. Right now, um, we're not near that, and we really need to get to that goal. Most of the claims that we're paying are on settled medical claims for people who have long separated from the town. We only have two active workers' compensation claims. So um, this fund needs to continue to be built up. So 190000 this year, but again, when in May and June, if we have any um, identified surpluses in line items, I'll recommend again that we try to move additional funds into the fund. Remember, when you're self-insured, if you have one employee that should get a, a <coughs> disability uh, from serving the town and they're 40 years old, we're paying that person's equivalent salary and medical bills until they're, you know, eligible to reach a retirement age. So, when you think about that, um, you know, seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars is not even a lot of money. But we do have stop loss insurance that kicks in on the medical um, at two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So we are insured against catastrophic loss that way. But again, we, the goal, this is a goal, and I, I've talked to you about it in the last two years, where we need to build up this fund balance. What's the balance now? Um, it's, I don't have that right off the top of my head. Uh, I think 
it's around 300,000, John, but I can double check and let you know. Uh, just, just curious to yeah. see how much longer <clears throat> to get to that number, hopefully. Right. Yep. So we're just creating reserve fund for. That's exactly what we're doing, Tony. Any questions? No. Okie doke. Move on to the last one for the evening uh, unemployment. In fiscal year 2012, we appropriated $300,000 for it. Um, and in fiscal year 13, we're uh, recommending $100,000. Um, I think the $300,000 was in, in uh, anticipation of a lot of layoffs. Um, some of them did occur. Um, and now that you've seen the trend and you know what claims you have outstanding, that this is more in line with what Yes, I mean, we had uh, FY08, FY09, we were tripling um, our employment due to number of layoffs and even into FY10. Um, and FY12 carried a contingency because we d hadn't decided about the override heading into that budget process or if an override would pass. So we were able again to um, be able to reduce that budget for FY13 significantly of what we had to have had to allocate to unemployment for the last several years. So that helped the overall town budget. Okay. And this closes out to the general fund? Any surplus closes out to the general fund. Any questions? No. Thank okay. you. Good. So that is it for um, agenda item number six for the budgets for this evening. Um, we've done item number seven. Why don't we take a two-second break, a, a one-minute break, and then we'll get into uh, um, item eight and item nine.
All right, so we'll move on now to item number eight. Um, item number eight is to uh, rescind a vote um, that we made at our last meeting for uh, section 21 and 23 of the health insurance. Um, is there like a motion or do you want to? Um, yes, we, uh, ta -ta 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 -ta, you know, that we, we needed to, uh, uh, there was a technicality that something was done improper during that so what we need to do tonight is to rescind our vote and then in item number nine we're going to uh, discuss it and vote it again so why don't we start by rescinding our vote from the prior meeting move that the board of selectmen <coughs> rescind the vote regarding mgl chapter 32b slash sections 21 through 23 taken on january 3rd mm -hmm. 2012. second um, second by mr norton all in favor Aye. 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 All opposed? None. It's unanimous. Three to zero. Okay, now we'll move on to item number nine, which is to um, discuss and vote the same matter again. Um, we, this was it's been discussed at the last couple of meetings. We can we can uh, discuss it again. Obviously, there's some people here for uh, for this item. Um, Mr. Clifford, and Mr. Luther here to to go over it. Um, what we're doing tonight is is um, taking the first step, which is initiating this uh, uh, Massachusetts law, which will um, essentially, as I understand it, and you two cor experts correct me if I'm wrong, um, it just takes the first step in getting the negotiations going to get um, um, our medical contract evaluated and to see where we want to take that. Um, the one extreme would be to go to the GIC, the other extreme would be to do nothing. And it really starts the clock so that this can actually go in effect for fiscal year 2013. Um, what we're doing now is I know the Mayflower um, plan is trying to get a comparable, I don't know, what do they call it, a uh, look-alike or some, some sort of comparable plan um, to the GIC so that there's things that we can look at and not disrupt people's coverage in terms of physicians, locations, and all that sort of stuff. And that's what the negotiation process between the insurance uh, uh, council and the different unions will will be involving um, tonight is not a night that we actually vote to make any changes to any one specific plan it's just basically announcing that we're going to um, go down this path um, that the state has allowed us to to get negotiations going and the, and the conversation starting as to where we're going to move our health plan is that right yes it is Mr. Chairman. if you'd like to add anything to it i know you said it last week but um, if not um, I'll open it up to see if there's any discussion. Any discussion from the board? No, I think we oh. pretty well discussed okay. it last week, but that's any discussion from the floor? Uh, Rick Johnson, Mr. Uh, President Yeah, if you don't mind just coming up so that that the people uh, at home can hear you. Just because the new rates came out for the Mayflower, I'd just like to have them go over what the savings are for the town. And sure. The that's all. <coughs> that's Sue, do you, I don't have that sheet in front of me. I know it was about $800,000, um, but there's a couple of caveats in there that I'll let you explain it all. And okay. um, basically, what we presented today to the unions were taking a look at, for FY13, based on the new rates that were published by the Mayflower Group, if, in fact, you continue to offer the same plans, and then we compared that to if you stayed with Mayflower but offered the, May, the um, GIC comparable or GIC lookalike plans that will be offered through the Mayflower Group. One difference um, from the last time we presented the numbers is that Mayflower voted to not make any changes to the Medicare supplement plans for your retirees who are over 65 and have Medicare. So it's only on the active plans. And based on enrollment assumptions, we are projecting that the savings going to that full um, benchmark plan would save a total of roughly $600,000. So the six hundred thousand dollars. What's one second? Um, if you does that, that doesn't include the amount of that that has to go back. Correct. Twenty five percent of the savings in the first year have to go back to the participants. Correct. So under the statute, you have to take up to twenty five percent of the first year savings. So ballpark one hundred and fifty thousand dollars and create a mitigation fund which would go to the subscribers to help help offset increased costs 
and there's a variety of ways that you could run the mitigation plan. Did you have another question? Can I just break it down to what the town is saving and what the employees are saving? Mm -hmm. Sure. Yes. So, based on the split right now, um, under your PPO and under your Medicare supplement plans, it's a 50 50 contribution split. And on your HMOs for an individual, the town pays 73% of the cost, the employee pays 27%. And for a family, the town pays 53% and the employees pay 47. So based on those breakouts and then based on the enrollments and the current plans, it's about a 57-43 split, 57% being paid by the town. So out of that 610,000 in savings, 356,000 is towards the town, is for the town, 254,000 is for the employees but out of that 356,000 in the first year, you, if you take the full 25% of the roughly 600,000 in savings, you're reducing your 356 by about $150,000. So the first year savings to the town would be in the ballpark of 200,000. And 400 to the employees. I, I, the, way, the way I wrote it down, that there's three hundred fifty-six thousand dollars of the six hundred. Let's round it off. Three hundred fifty yes. to the town, That's the, town savings. the town savings, and and again, this is what happens is the premium has gone down, yes. Yes. but yes. some of the the copay may have gone up, or the emergency room may have deductible yes. may have gone up, yes. right, yes. right, yes. and two hundred fifty thousand of those savings would go to the employees. Mm -hmm. After year, but in year one. 25% of the $600,000 of savings. No, it, it, it is 25% of the total savings. So you would be taking 25% of the 600, so about another 150,000 in year one would go to the employees in some form of mitigation. So about 400,000, 200,000 employee town in year one. In future years, I don't. Is there year two minimum contract? Or is it just year one that it's that? Year one. It's just yeah. year one. So in, you know, if you throw out that the total is six hundred ten thousand, but you have to be specific that just the town is doing three hundred fifty six thousand, and the employees, you know, that the town isn't saving that money that the employees are saving, but they're also paying higher copayments, right. higher deductibles, and higher doctor's fees or whatever. So it's just you know, the total savings is 610, but only the town side right. is 656. That's a good point. It's that's yeah. premium. That's I just want to clarify right. That's that. premium savings. So yeah. on your premium, it will go down by let's say year two, for instance. If these numbers hold true for another year, three hundred fifty thousand dollars. The premium is X, it's gonna go down to something, and the town pays fifty seven percent of X, so they'll save three hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and the employees will save two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. But of that, they'll have to pay a ten dollar copay instead of a five dollar. I don't. I'm making up numbers. Whatever it is. Yeah, I, just, I just didn't want people to realize that the town was saving eight hundred thousand dollars. Right. Or six hundred ten thousand dollars. That's what I wanted to clarify. Right. The insur the premium cost overall will go down six hundred thousand dollars, and then that's distributed by. It depends what plan you have. Really, what your Right. Okay. That's all I just wanted to be clear. Because when I listened to the meeting last week, it sounded like the town was going to save eight hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, that was the number that we had last yeah, week, but, but it's and now with this, if you in the total, you know, you said six hundred and ten thousand dollars, sounds like the town's gonna save six hundred and ten thousand no, dollars. Just trying to clarify the town is only saving three hundred and fifty six thousand dollars. Right. That's all. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Any other questions from Yes, ma'am. I'm Linda Barrett from Central Ave. Um, I'm on the cost of union, the wage cost of union. My question would be, has any thought been given to just postponing any action on this for a while to let the dust settle, see what happens with Mayflower, what happens with surrounding towns, and to do a little brainstorming with the Insurance Advisory Committee to see what other options we might have 
given that a lot of us who are not making a lot of money are going to be hit very, very hard with these increases in deductibles and co -pays. It may save a little bit on insurance premiums, but that is far, far outweighed by the increase in the rest of the insurance plan. Well, f a couple things. It's, it's First of all, it's my understanding that the insurance committee has gotten together two, three, five times. Five times. times. So the process is in place. And we do not have to go to that plan. That's one of the four options that can come out of this whole you know, discussion that will occur. Either we can decide to do nothing, we can decide to actually take the GIC plan, we can decide to take this lookalike plan, or the committee can come up with some other plan that says, let's do this. So all this is really doing is starting the clock saying, let's start talking about it, let's figure out what we're going to do, and whatever we're going to do, we want to do it so that it actually gets affected in fiscal year 2013. Because if we just postpone it, then it's not, you know, it's going to be a whole other year worth of uh, missed, op missed, you know, opportunity of saving money. For the town. For the town. Not for the employees. Right. Who work for the town. The, the employees will save too, but there are. I'm on that insurance yep. advisory committee, mm -hmm. and except for today, every one of them was just Coping Company representatives telling us what the state was doing. There was no discussion about plans, no discussion about how we should move forward, or whether we should move forward. That that's not true. I really um, I need to clarify that we've had at least two prior meetings where this was discussed before the legislation was even voted. There was tentative rate information given out at the last insurance advisory committee, and the reason there was another insurance advisory committee today was so that we could give the members the information on the rates that were just voted by Mayflower last Thursday. So, and I imagine this committee will get together a number of times over the next 30 days to just keep, keep the process going. Would be accepted. Well, the, it could be it could be that, or it could be something else. There could be another. I'm on that let me finish. I, I know. Let me finish. Well, there could be a discussion that says, "Here's what we'll do. Here's what the unions will do," and they'll say, "X, Y, and Z." Again, I don't know the details or I'm make up numbers. You know, the offices that will go from five dollars to fifty dollars, and and that shall create some sort of savings on the premium, and then we'll go with that. I mean, I think it's open to negotiations in terms of what the plan could end up looking like. Is that somewhat accurate? Um, there was another hand in the back. Yes, sir. Um, everything you're making reference to is in the, the premium savings. Yeah. And people that I talked about that do the GIC, firefighters throughout the state that are the GIC now, and you know, you, you say it's a look-alike plan or something like that, is that something to imitate? Yes. Okay. Um, these people are saying it's great as long as you don't get sick, and then the costs are crippled. You know, like Linda said, you know, we, you know, we make what we make uh, as public employees, and it just doesn't seem like that you're considering, you know, the well-being of the employee. Well, again, point of order: the gentleman's referring to the GIC plan. That is not what the town has been talking about with the IAC. But um, Louis Fitzgerald, uh, Mark Lab. I interpreted correctly. I believe they said it was a, almost a mirror image, but we'd stick with maybe the Mayflower. But to me, it almost seemed like they had a, almost matched the GIC. It seemed like it, that's how it was presented. That's how I took it. And I was saying, well, what is the difference then, really? You know, the way it was presented. It didn't. Right. Mr. Clifford? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the GIC plans are less expensive for the state less expensive for the employees in premiums. And the reason they have lower premiums is because they do have high deductibles, high co-pays. And most municipalities haven't gotten into the GIC. I think it's less than 20 at this point that are in it. But municipalities were seeking to save money. And essentially what the legislature has done is say you now have the option of joining the GIC or you can modify your existing plans to the most to level of the most popular GIC plan, which is Tufts Navigator. So it's it's not it's not the worst plan in the GIC, it's the most popular plan in the GIC. It does have a deductible that our current plans have now. 
and it does increase some of the co-pays, but it's, it's not, there are uh, several different plans in the GIC, which a lot of people may not consider attractive, but it's not the worst plan in the GIC, but it does change the level of co-pays and adds deductibles, which we haven't had in the past, but that was the goal of the legislation. Yes, sir. Well, I, yeah. well, I think I think he's I think what Mr. Clifford is trying to get across is that there are several GIC plans, and they're not taking the you know someone that may think they're very healthy may say look I'll take a huge deductible and I'll have a very slow pre, uh, copay, um, and that may not be as attractive to somebody else. So they're taking the one that's most popular. Well, all of us do. Are we all going to have that plan? I'm just curious. Which plan? Individually, you know. Which? Are people all going to be on the town plan? You know. Well, town employees have the option to be on. I don't. I pay my own. Okay. Just I, I think one of the points that we always need to remind people is, if the town does adopt the GIC look-alike plans, if you're in Network Blue today, you'll stay in Network Blue, but it will have different copays and deductibles. You, you won't have to change doctors, you won't have to change carriers, so there's, there's not, you Why know. do they have to mirror the Excuse GIC? me, excuse me. Just wait and then sit, raise your hand and say your name and then you'll be, go ahead. Do you want to speak? Yeah, yeah. Well, why do it, does it have to be similar to the GIC? Why is that just so, we keep getting thrown at us? Well, that, that's what the state has mandated as the level of um, insurance that you can match. This isn't coming from the town of Situate. This is coming from the Commonwealth. So they've said that municipalities can't, that they think this is a fair plan for state employees and they're saying municipalities can go along that path as well and they're saying that this is the man, or this is the guidelines that they're using. So it just happens to be one that the Commonwealth and all, federal, or all state employees are participating in. Nope, you're still you still have the floor. So the other insurance companies now coming up with plans to try and match right. that. Or right. Otherwise, the only other option would be to say, okay, you're going to go to the GIC plan, mm -hmm. which means new doctors, new locations, new plans, new carriers, new claims processes. What what we've asked all these all our participants to do is say, we don't want to disrupt people's health care. We want you to make a plan that would be comparable to what the state is saying that we can. Um, assimilate. And based on the legislation, virtually all of the carriers in Massachusetts have come up with GIC look-alike plans. Um, and I think we have made it clear that the town is not looking at the GIC this year, not to say that in future years it won't be an option to at least take a look at, but the advantage that you have this year in staying with the Mayflower Group is that the GIC does not offer Blue Cross Blue Shield plans. So by staying with Mayflower, you at least get to keep the current carrier that you have. Yes, ma'am. I have several members that have come to me with very valid concerns. They are basically working, they're putting their whole salary into health care for their family. They are very concerned that if when they can budget for a set premium, that's one thing. <coughs> but with all these deductibles and co-pays that will be hit unexpectedly, they're just not going to be able to budget for that. And they're very afraid that they may have to say no to health care when there's a need in their family because they just can't handle the extra fees that month. It's a very real concern among our membership. I, I was just hoping that the selectmen would have more compa compassion for the employees that work very, very hard to keep this town going for you. Tony. I have, I have a lot of compassion for each and every one of the employees in the town. I met with Trisha twice. I met with Sue today. Just, I'm nodding my head. I'm listening. I'm learning all the time. So to say we don't have compassion is not real accurate, Linda. Okay? I know most of everyone in this room. So it was explained to me it could very well cost those employees that are coming to you, it could cost them less. Their premiums are going down, all right? This 25% and, and I don't know what Tony knows, this 
could be mitigated to offset some costs that could be used for co-pays or deductibles, am I, am I correct? Yes. So I realize that, I realize that, but this is, you know, and, I, and it's, it's difficult for me to sit up here because I don't take part of the town insurance either to make decisions that might affect each and every one of you. But at the same time, I'm trying to balance this and see what's going to work best for the town at the same time. So, you know, I have been thinking about this for two weeks. So to say it's we're not compassionate, so you know. So. I'm not saying that you don't have compassion for it. I'm just asking for a lack of compassion right. in this particular instance. Right. Yes, sir. Parish 1406 Road. Um, when you're talking about GIC lookalikes, it's maybe Mr. Campbell that could speak to this, but it's my understanding that state employees pay 80 20, uh, state paying 80% of the premium, employees paying 20. For a constituent, for a family plan, it's 50 50. So you're already starting that deficit. You're paying a lot more for the plan, and you're trying to adopt a plan with greater co pays. I mean, it's simple math that. The person's going to be at a greater disadvantage, you know, to pay for insurance. So, do you want to say? Yeah, the um, the intent of the legislation is to talk about making benefit changes. It specifically excludes any talk about making contribution changes. What happens when, and and actually on the family plan, it's a fifty-three forty-seven split which I know to the employee seems like it's a low contribution. The advantage when you're making a change of this nature is that because you are paying 47% of the premium, you actually see 47% of the savings. In the communities, and, and I know that that doesn't necessarily make people feel great, but it, it equates to, just as an example, for somebody who's on HMO Blue, to make this change from the current plans to the GIC lookalike plan, they're going to save roughly $800 a year on, on their premiums. So that certainly, if they had three people in their family who had to hit the deductible, that covers the deductible. Now, granted, there are other copay increases and different copays, et cetera. But for a good portion of the people, they're not going to have three deductibles. And there are certain situations um, where your costs will go down. For example, under this plan, preventive services will be covered in full and some of the lab work associated with preventive office visits, for example, will be covered in full. So there definitely are situations where that $800 in premium savings to the family will ultimately result in a cost reduction to that family. And certainly there are situations where somebody who has extreme utilization, it, it could end up costing them more. Under sections 21 through 23, part of the negotiations during that 30-day period is talking about the mitigation fund. And the town is responsible for putting forth a mitigation proposal. There's nothing to say that the unions can't come back and say, well, we know it's only the first year savings, but we really want to target it for people who have unusual circumstances. In a situation like that, even though it's just the savings from the first year, that plan could potentially continue for several years and make funding available for that situation. Yes, ma'am. You mentioned several times the phrase starting the clock. Could you clarify, does this vote tonight start that 30-day time limit within which the unions and the town have to come up with an agreement? No. no. Mr. Clifford? If, if I could just give a very quick overview of the process. Once the board accepts the statute, um, Sue's been working with Patricia to try to pull data together, a full package with current plans, description of the proposed changes. Basically, everybody in the IAC will get a very comprehensive package. And there'll be a period of 10 days to meet with the IAC to talk about this. Once that period ends, then you move to the PEC, the Public Employee Committee. And there's notice required, and that's another 30 days. I mean, with the notices, the information that has to be distributed, really a best case scenario is two months from now, you could potentially complete the process. But the 30-day clock doesn't start for a few weeks. So that's, that's really the second step. The first step is the IAC. The second step is the PEC. 
but this vote this evening is what would start the process. It would, it would allow you to start. The allow us to start the process. Yes, sir. Is there any guarantee that we'd be given the easy opportunity to continue to purchase the level of coverage that we're currently buying? to not drop to a plan that has greater co-pays? Good question. If they wanted, is is the non-GIC look-alike Blue Cross Blue Shield HMO Blue Plan going to be available the way they have it now, but the premium would be obviously much higher? Well, I think like you said, there really are four options that can come out of this, adopting this section, and one of those options is doing nothing which basically would mean that you would continue with your current plan. Well, this would actually be doing something because the premium the premium would go up. It's just not uh, it's not no. it, the premiums are staying the same for that plan. But well, I think what you're saying is keep my co-pays at what's your co what's your office visit? $5. So five five dollars or um, fifteen dollars. You know, could you keep that the same and just pay more? I'll, I'll just yeah. like to make the question: Are we going to be able to, on July first, be continue to be offered the same plan, or our our choice is going to be limited to a plan with uh, less benefits? No, no. The, when Mayflower voted the rates vary for July one, it's the same level of plan. Okay. So, so we, regardless of No, I, I don't I, think there's essentially the, the town doesn't have the option of giving the employees kind of a menu approach where they can pick the lower deductibles and pay the high premiums and everything. The town has to decide do we want the GIC lookalike plans and that's all that will be available or does the town want to do nothing and that would be all that's available. So it's not a menu style approach where you would give the employees the option to pick unless you choose the GIC lookalike plans you don't get the savings so let's say for instance um, say we want we negotiated something with the unions that said we're going to keep the plans the way they are now but the copay or the office visit is going to be a hundred dollars that's that's just what we all agreed on that that's what we'd rather have than the GIC lookalike obviously I'm just joking on the numbers but is that that would be an option as well right somewhere in between where we could negotiate something with the unions where we said okay you're gonna have the same rate the same everything same thing but but one thing is going to change or two things um, there are some ways that you can tailor your plan but basically the plans are what the Mayflower group makes available to you it's it's the GIC look-alike it's what's called the rate saver and then it's the plans that you have now so there's three levels. Um, copay would be a plan design. That, uh, well, no, I, whatever you would, you know, they would have the same exact thing that they have right now, but there'd be some clause in a contract that would say something else. You know, that I'll, hypothetically the split changes. It's no longer 5347. It's 7525. I don't. Know. That's that's a potential. Right. I'm making up numbers here, guys. So. Um, but so there, it seems like there is room for conversation and negotiation, but more than likely it's, it seems like most of the communities go with the lookalike plan. Is that That's fair to say? But at what step in the process do we, does the plan change to the GIC lookalike? I think that's what this two month period that Mr. Clifford's talking about is where you talk about all that stuff. Right, the town's required to give you the, the union, the IAC a formal proposal and a proposal to um, how it would um, suggest the mitigation funds, the 25% be shared. And then that's the basis for the conversation to begin, um, either with the IAC or more formally through the PUC at some point. Just to reiterate the first question, can we confirm that GIC is something offered traditionally for state employees
But they're also paying 25 and 35 dollar copays and higher deductibles. The town of Situate has a five dollar copay. Every other member unit in Mayflower has 10 or 15 or 25. We are the only town that is subsidizing the copay right now, and you have no deductibles. And that's really the, where the cost savings for both the town and the employee come in on the premium base by increasing the deductibles and the co-pays which most folks, especially in the GIC and other places, have been doing for a while. And we pay 53 on average, 47, and the law requires 50 percent. So we're already above the amount required by law. Above the amount required by law. Okay. Um, again, just so it's clear, the vote here tonight does not uh, implement anything. It just implements starting of a process, which at the two extremes again could be we do nothing or that we um, um, you know go go to the actual gig plan itself um, I'll give you one last comment yes my primary care physician is a past general am I going to be able to do that if, if you are it's the way I understand it if you currently have them under your plan they are going to be under the GIC lookalike plan as well I'll say yes. <laughs> if they're in, yeah. If they're, yes. if they're in the, if they're currently in your network blue plan, they would still be in the. If you pay that. Okay. This is the last one. Yes, ma'am. much more expensive 
if you visit those hospitals, you're seeing much more. All right, so is there a motion? There will be a motion, Mr. Chairman. I think we can, you know. Number nine? Uh, number nine. Move that the Board of Selectmen elect to engage in the process to change health insurance benefits pursuant to Mass General Law, Chapter 32B, Sections 21 23. Second. Second. Second by Mr. Harris. Further it's discussion? Just discussion. I think Sean said it, uh, maybe you, you, Mr. Chairman. This starts the process. It's not the end of the process. It's the start of the process. And, and I think that if everyone uh, goes into the process with, with, the, with an open mind and trying to do the right thing, I, I, you know, I, I know this board and this town is, is, has always been interested, always been interested in, in, in the welfare of the employees, and we appreciate all the employees have done. Uh, and this, in some ways, is to continue that appreciation by, by, by hoping to assure that there won't be layoffs down the road. I mean, there's a lot of things happening. We all know it. I can show you articles here showing uh, shortfalls in retirement and health insurance that are, I mean, mind-boggling. They're, they're, they're scary uh, what could happen down the road as far as unless some of these things are addressed. Uh, hopefully, this starts the process, like I said, so that's why. Uh, I'll be voting for it, and let's hope it works out. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, it's unanimous, three to zero. Thank you for coming in. Two of you again. Uh, moving on to item number 10, the town administrator's report. I'll wait for John. for the town receipts and expenditures for the period through November 30th. Um, on the receipt end, you will see that we are um, obviously above in the real estate um, collection as a result of the override. This doesn't really reflect the receipts that we're getting with the most recent tax bills that are up. Our permits and inspections are down um, for the same period last year. But we're up considerably in the local receipts, um, which consists of things like ambulance uh, receipts. As you know, when I um, finalized the budget that I presented to you, I revised the projection for the local receipts somewhat. So this is a number that we want to make sure continues to run favorably. Um, and then um, Widow's Walk is doing better in November than it was in November of last year, and hopefully that will be a positive sign. I think Bob mentioned that. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions on that. The expenditure side of the budget, we're actually looking favorable um, in some accounts, which means our expenses are down in electricity and gas for the period the same time last year. Obviously, unemployment's down significantly, and snow and ice is down significantly. Knock on wood. Um, I believe Chief Judge spoke earlier about the overtime um, issues, but again, he's having anticipates a firefighter coming on soon, and that was something we recognized by asking for additional funds in the override. Um, same with police even though that's up higher than it was over the same period last year. 
Um, as Chief mentioned, we interviewed a number of individuals for appointments in the police department. Some of those are permanent intermittents, which means they go to a short academy, and we can get them on the street, hopefully, to m mitigate the overtime costs. Obviously, mm -hmm. permanent officers will be um, 12 to 18 months down the line, probably, before they're on the street. But um, I've spoken with both the chiefs about the overtime budget, and I'm confident at this point of their ability to manage it. So those are the um, issues. And the only other one is fuel. Gas continues to be up and down and sort of all over the place. So it is up for the same period, about $34,000 um, um, as it w from last year. But we'll continue to uh, track that. So I'm happy to answer any questions on that. Um, two other items, um, the board had a bid opening on Thursday for the RFP on the driftway, which we discussed earlier this evening. We received one bid. I am in the process of putting together a subcommittee to review that RFP to ensure that it was um, fully responded to with all the various elements. Once that happens, we'll come forward to the board with a recommendation um, on whether or not um, it wants to take the next step in the process. So I will keep you posted on that. It will probably be a couple of weeks at best on that. And the last thing that um, I refer to in my budget is um, the legislature this year passed $5 million to give grants to communities that promote regional services or um, programs that can be shared. And um, today, the town submitted an application with the towns of Norwell and Marshfield to share a human resources administrator and what that person would essentially do for the three towns that have no human resource, dedicated human resource function right now is to do centralized um, advertising, paper screening of applicants. They would handle um, um, making sure the towns were up to date in compliance with any p personnel policies that need to change relative to changes in the law. Um, they would also assist with salary surveys or personnel issues around to writing job descriptions or employee training issues and things like that. The way the grant would work is it would be 100%, 75%, 50%, 20% in terms of um, eventually at the end of like a four or five year period, the towns would have to pick up the full cost themselves, but sharing those things among three towns um, which meets the goals of that g grant program we think would be fairly competitive. So Tony signed the paperwork Friday, I had to sign as well, and that was submitted today. So um, we can ask Representative Cantwell Bradley and Senator Headland to support once it goes in. And that's all I have. Mike? My letter will be the most important one. <laughs> we try to pick down Clearly. two representatives <laughs> so you wouldn't have split loyalties. Oh, sure, sure. That's quite a bit. Any questions? Just one or two or so. Um, I noticed from the uh, from the budget, obviously, uh, obviously, there's nothing about snow or snow removal. And I was thinking, you know, based on last year, I thought we had a few snowstorms. So, are, are we saving money given the fact that we're not sending out or employing, you know, uh, independent contractors to plow or, or utilizing? <coughs> yes, um, through November 30th, we'd only spent twenty-seven hundred dollars. Right, so you haven't got the summer. Two hundred eighty thousand. Um, I have spoken with Mr. Bangett because once we see the capital plan, uh, the capital plan that I submitted recommends um, construction of a salt shed for $85,000. And I anticipate that if the winter continues and we have a surplus in the snow and ice budget, then we may be able to actually build that out of the snow and ice budget, and that will free up another 85000 in free cash for additional capital so another project can be funded this year. So. Hopefully, um, we'll be able to do that because winter can be I didn't mean to jinx the town yeah, with I a know. whole I bunch of snow know. coming the next month or two, but just out of curiosity. Thanks. Uh, no, number 11 is other business. None. Any, anything? None. 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 All right. I do have to um, give share some other business because I think it was really a special moment, certainly for the town. I'll make a disclosure, my son was on the team, and it's kind of a sports update that normally you'd give Tony, but, oh, right. you know, I want to thank, Sorry, um, I, I, I have to tell you, I have to say that, um, thank two different people, um, husband and wife, Robin and uh, Sean Sullivan, um, who had arranged for the travel basketball team for Situate 
fifth grade to be able to go out uh, last Friday and play basketball during halftime at the uh, Boston Garden during the Celtics Bulls game. And you know, um, it was a really special moment for the kids. They thoroughly enjoyed it. It's a special moment given the fact that, you know, that opportunity very rarely comes to to any kid given uh, fifth grade, fourth grade, or what have you, and uh, unless you make state championship. And I have to tell you, you know, that's a really nice thing. It was, benef it was great for the town of Situate um, showing up on, on the parquet floor playing during halftime. And uh, I wanted to at least say thanks to them. Um, and the kids represented uh, uh, Situate very well. It was uh, the team was split up playing each other. Uh, and it was a tie. It was a draw. So uh, neither team lost. Situate won ultimately. But I wanted to thank them personally and, and also share that with everybody. Thank you. Yes. While we're on that note, Tony, or something else you maybe might have slipped by, uh, the girls' varsity basketball team is off to a 6-0 and start. <laughs> Did you have it written down there? I've written down. <laughs> and uh, with any luck, they'll be playing at the Garden. Yeah. Um, I have one other thing, if you have, can give me one more moment. Sure. <clears throat> a young uh, person, his name is Sean Patrick McGuigan, approached my wife at Jenkins School. He's a first grader. And he had an idea, and I ran it by Jennifer Vitelli, and she thought it was a wonderful idea. He wants to know if the town could build a rink, much like what you see in the backyards. And he thought it would be a great spot at the Common. It would be, but parking might be a little difficult. So I said that I'd mention it and, and bring it to the board's attention. I mentioned it to Jennifer. She thought it was a great idea, possibly, you know, maybe at the high school campus or something. But I just think, you know, maybe it's something we can talk about for, for next year gives a, a lot of kids the opportunity to skate when the ponds may not be safe. Parents can park where they can see them. And I just uh, told them that I'd bring that along and uh, and see where it goes. It's a great idea. Right. <coughs> you could do it at Cubworth too. It, we, you know, as long as it's parking, you know, so I think it's great. It's so. par I had to tell you, it's funny because when I was in Boston, that was a discussion that was made between people sitting around the table. Um, and they said the same thing. Growing up, we used to have outdoor rinks. I remember growing up, there was an outdoor rink around the corner at the uh, middle school with wooden boards and, you know, the, actually they brought a Zamboni down to <laughs> cover the ice <laughs> that was chewed up. But I have to say, that should be, given the size, given the town and given the uh, strong penchant for hockey in this area. I think it makes sense. I know many times they'll probably end up being, you know, watered and because of the temperatures, but I think Sean, Sean's idea, Sean McGuigan's idea is a great idea. They freeze quicker than the ponds, and it's just it's just great, great outdoor yeah. activity. So could uh, they park around the common? I mean, if if it were at the common, I know it's not no parking, but you know, well, can if we? If they did it at Cudworth, they could park it behind gates, behind the tennis courts. Cudworth would be a better spot, I think. I'll get back to yeah. him and see if he can come up with an idea. Yeah. 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 No, we couldn't so. come up with anything. <laughs> yeah. so. Should he's probably in bed now, but maybe his parents will tell him that his name was mentioned. Yeah. So. Good, I like that idea, Sean. Not you, young Sean. That's right. Um, and the girls' basketball team is doing great, and so is the boys' basketball team, by the way. They are also playing very well. They, you know, typically on Tuesday or Friday nights, they're playing one home and one away game. And there's usually a pretty good turnout. They have the uh, JV game and then the varsity game afterwards. So if you have some free time, swing down there. It's good entertainment. Um, and the high school team did play at the Garden, I think it was two or three years ago, when they went to the state finals. So there is a chance. Um, two other quick things. Um, just want to reiterate what Al brought up earlier today, that this Saturday at Widow's Walk parking lot, there's an opportunity for anybody to go sign one of the blades of the windmill. So um, go down there, park. There'll be some sort of staging where you can walk up and put your, uh, your initials or your name on one of the blades, and you can watch it spin around. Um, and I think he said it was from one to three. Um, and lastly, um, there's been a, a lot of things written about, um, about the tax bills that have recently gone out. And I just want to let people know, I, I, I went down through the abatement process earlier this week just to see how it was and how difficult it was and all that sort of stuff. And it's, it's actually very, very easy. And, and all the people down in the assessor's office are, are very open to give you your information and let you print out your card and look at your property and all this sort of stuff. So if you have any questions at all, that's the place where you go. You, um, <coughs> you can only make an abatement for the bills that just came out until February 1st. Um, but if you have any questions at all on your property or on your tax bill, Go to the assessor's office or email them, and they will be happy to uh, answer your questions. Um, that's all I have. Anything else from anybody? I have right. nothing. Move on to uh, number 12, correspondence. I don't see any. Are there any 
I didn't see it. No. Okay. So go on to number 13, which is um, acceptance of the minutes. Move the Board of Selectmen vote to accept the minutes for January 3rd, 2012. Second. Second by Mr. Harris. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye it's unanimous. And lastly, uh, number 14, are we going into executive session? Yes. Um, uh, move, uh, we're going to go to executive session for the first exchange, lease, or retail value of property. Um, Jim? Yes. 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 And we will not be returning to um, open session after this. So good night, everybody. Thanks, Zach.